Hi, my name is Flossie. I'm a bi-hemispherical traveller. Living in British Columbia, Canada in my home-built van, my tiny home on wheels. I'm back in New Zealand right now, travelling the length of the country in a van. And I'm excited to share with you this magical, subtropical country where I was born. From here, the next steps are to go further south. We're going to the central plateau where the uh, land rises, it turns to tussock grass, our volcanic mountains will be there, and then heading further down towards Wellington. And Wellington is where the ferry is to cross from the North Island to the South Island. Anyway, I'm buzzing, it's great, it's early in the morning. <laughs> track by accident and instead of a 1.4 kilometer walk we signed ourselves up for a 4.5 by accident but it's very pretty and there's nobody else on it which is even better off to the waterfall we walked a mountain biking track to take the scenic route to Hoka Falls set of waterfalls on the Waikato River, which drains Lake Taupo. I think these are wood ear mushrooms. Look at them. They're old. Look at them. They're amazing. I think it's a wood ear. I'm not entirely sure. If you know, put it in the comments down below. Somewhere down there there's water. A few hundred meters upstream from the Hooker Falls, the Waikato River narrows from approximately a hundred meters across to a canyon of only 15 meters across, creating these impressive falls. The name Hooker in Maori is the word foam. It is appropriate as the water falling in rapids certainly resembled foam, especially under flooding conditions with its bright crystal blue pure water. About 200,000 litres of water plunge 9 metres over great rock face of Hooker Falls every second. That's enough to fill five Olympic swimming pools every minute. Such a momentous flow of water creates a dangerous undertow at the bottom of the falls. This has claimed the craft of many river users foolhardy enough to try and navigate the falls. The flow over the falls is so strong it prevents the upstream migration of trout and native fish such as eels.
we found. Isn't this cute? Gin in a tin. And it is pomegranate, raspberry, and cardamom. It's really delicious with fijoa or lychee. Yum, 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 yum. Thanks to the lakes, to the oceans, everyone's pain was lifted up. Tears made up the water, and anger made up the waves. The voice of the wind that can't be heard. When you have swum in the sea, a lake will no longer do. Everywhere else was always a pond, but an ocean was always you. nice that it's warm and outside is beautiful swimming in the lakes has been awesome I'm definitely more of an ocean person than a lake person though but it's so nice to get out and about and we're finally on our way further south close to Wellington and feeling that it's finally summer is great partially because I need the sun. I'm a solar powered human. I'm basically a leaf. I've said this before. Um, getting seasonal depression, sometimes getting away to the sun in the middle of winter, or for me, coming to a place that feels like it's supposed to be summer here at this time of year, because this is what I grew up with. I was used to having summer in December, January, February, March. Oh, it feels right. But it's increased my mood, my happiness immensely. It has been really nice. Um, missing the salt water, but you know, we'll find some soon. Once we cross over on the ferry from Wellington to Picton, that'll be great. Uh, yeah. This road is so high. It's one of the few places that's not a mountain in New Zealand. They get snow and ice in the winter. And the two, three big volcanoes come into sight soonish. We're still winding our way through the valleys beforehand. Ooh, such curvy, windy roads. But at least there's blue sky. Mountain has clouds on it. See, but we can see the other ones.
towered in front of us still. Ropehu, Narahoe, and Tongariro. They mark the southern limits of the Taupo one. volcanic zone. A horseshoe-shaped series of volcanic phenomena make up the Pacific Ocean's ring of fire. Mount Narahoe is also the famous Mount Doom in the Lord of the Rings. Mount Ropehu, at an elevation of 2,797 meters, last erupted only on the 25th of September 2007. I still lived in New Zealand at this point. Mount Narahoe, at an elevation of 2,291 meters, last erupted long ago in 1977. Some of you, I'm sure, were around then. Mount Tongariro, at an elevation of 1,978, last erupted in 21st of November, 2012. Oh my gosh, this volcano is still considered active, not dormant. And on some fine days, a small tuft of steam can be seen rising from this volcano up into the blue sky. When you hear central, often it means city, a bit of hustle and bustle, but New Zealand's central plateau throws that all out the window. It is a volcanic plateau covering much of the central North Island of New Zealand, with volcanoes, lava plateaus and crater lakes. The plateau has a mild climate, although the temperature regularly falls below freezing in winter, and snow can often fall between March and October. The desert road on State Highway 1 is often closed by snow in winter for brief periods. The barren, ash-laden soils and harsh alpine climate leave the highland largely bare and unprofitable, capable of only growing scrubby plants, tussock grasses and hardy desert-like plants. This area is known as the Rangipaho Desert, although it is not quite a true desert as its annual rainfall is over 1,000 mm per annum. And the real reason for the low sparse vegetation was the mass sterilization of seeds caused by the 26,000 year old Taupo eruption which swept white hot ignimbrite through this valley. As quickly as we enter the desert highlands, the terrain, the agriculture, the flora and fauna change again. We are now in sheep territory. The native bush long ago cleared to create the rolling hills you now see dotted with thousands of sheep, cattle and sometimes farmed deer. New Zealand has seven times more residents on four legs than two. 5 million people to 26 million sheep and 10 million cows. And dairy, meat and wool account for more than half of the nation's export revenue. But this abundance comes with great environmental cost, not only to the native bush, but half of New Zealand's greenhouse gases come from ag agriculture, mostly as biological methane, nitrous oxide from livestock, burps, urine, and manure. For years and years of walking back and forth back to culture. And then this green pit here is forested uh, agriculturally monoculture country. Pine forest growing for lumber and paper. There's more over there. You can see the different colour between the lighter natural wood and the dark monoculture.
There's a cliff bank that runs behind all these bushes up there. And that's where the glowworms hide. Full of glowworms up there. All behind here. This may not look like much, but at night time, this bank becomes full of little blue and green stars right below the bush. Oh, the Tui. This is a guardian tree. And there's another one over there. There's a bird up there. I can see it, but the camera can't. This tree is huge. The forest is full of big vines like this and they just zoom up into the forest and connect everything. It's pretty cool. Although we call the forest the bush here. one of my favorite spots. This campground is super significant to me. It's where I first was introduced to chosen family and intergenerational community and complete acceptance of who I was and what you wanted to be and how you wanted to express that and surrounded by hundreds of other people doing exactly the same. Your weirdness, your queerness, your fabulosity could just be whatever it wanted to be and there was no expectations. There was complete freedom and a deep connection with nature at the same time which to me is pretty special I mean just look at this it's beautiful hello guardian hello forest guardian hello beautiful tree hello protector and keeper of nature Do you remember the very special places in the world that have been turning points for change in your life?
when you truly stepped into the world of possibilities that is the galaxy inside you, where part of your soul was set free, where you truly believed your dreams could indeed be a possibility. Sometimes these places are memories we have as kids. Times we truly didn't have a care in the world as teens or as young adults. Places where you could just be you. Close your eyes for a second. Imagine your body and how that feels. Imagine what that place looked like, what it sounded like, what it smelled like. This is that place for me. Thank you so much for continuing to come with me on this homeland, heart-opening journey with me. It's been a vulnerable time from where I've come from to who I am now. I really appreciate you watching. I read all of your comments, though I really haven't had time to reply to many while traveling. They do mean a lot. If you enjoy this, if it struck a chord, please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe or share to help others find it too. Patreons get early accesses, postcards from down under, for as just as little as a couple of bucks, which makes a huge difference to me. So thank you so much. I'll see you all next week with another episode where we finally catch the ferry from Wellington to the South Island of New Zealand. Woohoo!